Hey everyone, Lance Earl here. I um, had something happen uh, a few days ago and I had to write a new chapter in my book because of it and I felt like I needed to make a video and share this with you. You see, someone who I desperately love was diagnosed with colon cancer, which of course is a terrible thing, a sad thing, and, and of course we're lifting him up in prayer because we do care about him, but he said something that I found very perplexing, just, just considering who he is. He pled with those people that he loves to not skip or be uh, kind of flaky in getting your colonoscopies. He said, be sure to do that so that you don't find yourselves in problems. And, and that is very, very good counsel. But coming from him, it seemed rather strange to me. And I'd like to share with you the reasons why. You see, there's different types of cancer. And, and so I'm going to start with you in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And it reads, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, now think about that. He's saying if, if it's just something, if it's just a disease or evil or a sickness that can kill your body, don't, don't worry about it. But if it can kill your body and your soul and lead you down to hell, that is what Jesus tells us to concern ourselves with. And so, like I said, as this person recommended that we be very diligent in having our health screenings, I got to thinking, but God has asked us to do the same thing. Come with me, will you? And let's go look at God's health screening policies. So we begin looking at God's health screenings in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. It goes on to tell us how we can know who are true and false prophets. But the point I want to make here is God has been clear. He says, test every spirit. So these tests, these are our spiritual health screenings so that we can recognize false prophets, false teachers, those things that would lead us down to hell, destroying both body and soul. And so the first question is, well, how often does God say have a health screening? You know, some of these tests, we have them every five years and every 10 years, uh, you know, as prescribed by the medical industry, but in God's economy, we test every spirit. So we, we need to test at least as often as there is another spirit. But I would say even more so than that, we need to test everything all the time. And we need to be in God's word so that we are prepared to test a teaching, a new teaching, a new spirit when it comes along. Now, the beauty is God didn't just say test and leave us to wonder how to do it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17 verse 11. Now this is Paul and Silas. They're among the Bereans. And this is what Luke wrote about them. He says, now the Jews were more noble than those of Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What makes this very incredible is that these Berean Jews were called more noble than the rest. And, and why? Now, the question I would ask is if the Brians are truly more noble than the others, than the rest, why would we not want to know who they are and what makes them noble? Well, what made them noble is they tested every spirit, as John recommended. And so even when Paul came, now this is the great apostle Paul, he was shipwrecked and he didn't bother to drown. He was bitten by a viper and he didn't die. They drug him out of the city threw him down on the ground and stoned him to death, but he didn't die. He woke up a few hours later and went, oh man, that's a big headache, but he went back to work. When he was preaching, a man fell from a window and died, and Paul raised him from the dead. This is the amazing Apostle Paul. If anyone deserves to be believed, it would be Paul, and yet the Bereans tested everything he said. And the book of Acts tells us that made them noble. Now, it just didn't leave us with this either. God prepares us with everything we need. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1, it says, If a prophet 
or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams. It goes on and tells us that we must put that prophet or dreamer of dreams to death. So here we have God's pattern, God's health screening for someone who comes and says, here's another God, let's follow him. And even if he, if he works, signs and wonders, if he, even if he walks and talks and looks like a prophet or the most cool televangelist, if he has all those things going for him and he doesn't teach you to follow the God of the Bible, you must do away with him, be done with him. But God didn't leave us there. He gave us more. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 20. It says, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, How may we know the word of the Lord? Has, that he has not spoken. And when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Presumptuously. So here we have a test for those who say, let us follow other gods. Here we have a test for those who say, um, here's, here's a prophecy, this will come to pass, and it doesn't. And the crazy thing is, if we are willing to test, we soon find false prophets. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, all down, those, those people, they said that Jesus was taken to the cross because he was a polygamist. That is another God. They say that Jesus cannot forgive all sins, but only certain sins. And if a man or woman sins beyond that and hopes to be forgiven, he must die. He must shed his own blood, be murdered by a fellow Mormon in order that God would forgive them. That's another God. Joseph Smith said the temple will be raised before the end of that current living Mormon generation. And, and it's not there. That lot is still vacant. There's just too many things. Well, But let's go on. God didn't just leave us with that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 kind of brings all this together for us in, in three parts. And I'd like to examine each one. First of all, starting in verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered of thorn bushes or figs of thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And so again, we take a look at the leaders of Mormonism, the fruits of Mormonism, polygamy, palandry. They said it was a restoration of God's church, but God's pattern was given us in Genesis. One man, one woman, so shall a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. And the two, the two become one flesh. No, not, not the three, not the four, not the 40. And so there's a problem here. These, these false prophets bring us things that we can't find in God's pattern as laid out in the Bible. It goes on and it talks about the final state of these people when they stand before God. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, what is the will of our Father? John 6, verse 29 says that the work of God is that we believe the one he sent. God sent Jesus Christ. We are to believe him. That is God's work. That is our work. We are doing God's work when we believe Jesus. Nothing more is required. We just believe Jesus and then live our lives as if we really do believe because our actions show proof of our belief. But it says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name 
and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's part two. Wolves in sheep's clothing come and we identify them. If we don't, we are destroyed and sent away from God. And part three will be familiar to you. Starting in verse 24, it says, Every man then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is our rock. We build our lives, our homes, everything on the rock of Jesus Christ. And we will be saved. It goes on and it says, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on the rock, the Savior, our God. Verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. What is a great fall if you are trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ? The great fall happens when he says to you, verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, workers of iniquity. I was talking to another man, a, a Mormon, and I shared this exact message that I've shared with you today. I shared it with him and he said, and what if I don't work these tests against my Mormon leaders? I would like to take you back to Deuteronomy 18 because there's a part there that I specifically saved for last. Deuteronomy 18 tells us that if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams comes and he says, come with me after other gods, we're to get rid of him. But there's a second part that most people miss, and I want to share that with you now. Ha, <laughs> sorry, Deuteronomy 13. I know where I'm going. I do. Give me a minute, I'll get there. Deuteronomy 13. And this is the part I didn't share with you. It says, For the Lord your God is testing you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with your heart and with your soul. So the question, what if we don't have these spiritual health screenings and test every spirit, every prophet, every teacher, every new doctrine, every everything we test against the word that God has already given us? What if we say we won't? It's very simple. We send God a message. We don't love you. I'm Lance Earl. I'll see you soon.